Yeah, I'm uh, very honored and privileged to have with us today uh, Heng Ji, Professor Heng Ji from uh, newly at uh, UIUC, uh, previously at RPI. Uh, she is a, a major force in NLP, especially with uh, uh, the deep neural technologies that have come out. Uh, I haven't known Heng for very long. I met her at ACL uh, last year, but we uh, both read each other's papers and I think she has a super productive research group and I think uh, uh, we can learn a lot from her lessons. Uh, she chose two different talks to give. Uh, one that she gave yesterday at SSNLP, which is for a wider crowd, and because my group works a lot on uh, scholarly document analysis, I thought she could give a, a more focused talk with us. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Thanks so much. Well, I Actually, this one is my favorite book. Uh, it's more uh, focused and more recent, and uh, uh, I'm reading this not just for fun days, but in this occasion. So this one should be more interesting. Uh, so this is done by my student, um, Jimmy Wong. He was my undergrad student at uh, PR, and now he's my student at UIOC. Yeah, she was my first student, actually. Uh, so but it was the work done by Jimmy, and the uh, data collaboration with uh, Kevin Knight at the beginning. So the idea here is to be able to understand the older papers and give the knowledge graph, and then we can put these in new ideas, and then we use natural integration to like keep the new ideas. So that's the whole of the work here. Uh, so I know some of you did not attend my uh, talk yesterday, so I just want to give you a very quick brief about uh, what is information injection and uh, what is the mutual application of knowledge graph construction. So for those of you who already Talk, you can um, just patiently wait for me for a few minutes. So, the whole idea of knowledge construction is to convert text data from unstructured format to some structured form. Uh, so, here's a sentence that um, we give as input, and we want to construct uh, a knowledge graph. Each node is a uh, entity, and the, each edge is relation. So, um, and after that, we can do for some knowledge based population. We can uh, link the entities to some external knowledge base. For example, uh, E.T. Young, uh, she is my favorite dancer, and we can do this fusion uh, between this real uh, dancer and other people who have the same name. And then we can populate all the information about these entities. Um, so, in the past, maybe for five years, we are able to extend the portability of the from one domain to an open domain, and from one language to three different languages, and uh, from you know, one modality to multiple media. So I already showed some examples yesterday about the traditional way to use this kind of techniques. So we got a lot of uh, support from uh, DOD um, from US. So many we work on the best of For example, uh, you can monitor what's happening about the Natural disaster reported from 300 languages. And uh, we also work a lot on intelligence analysis. So you can keep checking a uh, person's activity over time, or you can check you know, who is doing what, home, and what events are related to each other. And you can look at who is related to Putin and uh, check that all the time, what they are doing with each other. So putting things all together, we can do uh, automatic intelligence analysis. So this is an example showing the NH17 airline crash. So from multimedia multilingual data, we can construct this knowledge graph. Uh, so each node, as you can see, is the entity and the relation and the edges, uh, cache the edges and the events are involved in these entities. And then from the this uh, graph, you can see we have the couple one that's telling us uh, the um, so the question is who shot that image seventy? And then the purple one clearly shows Ukrainian government uh, shut down image seventy. And the blue one here shows another hypothesis, which is a pro large rebels in Ukraine shut down and So these two hypotheses are conflicting. And then we present these two uh, hypotheses to a human analyst. And the human analyst can use his or her own background knowledge. And uh, they will say, oh, I, based on my background knowledge, I know this missile is owned by Russian government. So that's conflicting with this hypothesis uh, because the missile is owned by uh, Russian government. So it's really unlikely for Ukrainian government to be the um, so then he can just edit this graph, and then we only keep the, um, the blue hypothesis, which is a uh, large show the bells um, shutdown. So 
So that's a whole framework. And uh, you can see here, we can save a lot of time. So they, they don't need to read the multimedia and multimedia documents from scratch. They can just uh, compare them out loud. So this is something what we want to do for scientists. So we, we don't want them to read the media's papers. Um, instead, they should just look at the natural app and then do their scientific discovery based on the natural app. Okay. Uh, so I showed uh, another example, it's the human model value. So uh, a lot of the implicit information is hidden in what you say. So this module is post on Facebook or Twitter. We should be able to tell how much you care about power, for example, or how much you care, how much money you will donate to uh, what's big. So we did uh, two experiments. One is that uh, we tried to look at the our Baltimore protest in 2015, you can clearly see the number of arrests correlates with the human model value. So when Brad Gray, when he was uh, injured, when he was sent to hospital, you can see there's a peak about the number of arrests. So we can use this kind of information to predict what's going to happen and uh, how likely the protest will become violent. So this is a, a major paper we published last year. And then we further extend that to the county level for the United States. So from here, you can see uh, we show you how much uh, people uh, uh, care about authority in the United States on county level. And you can see, you know, California and uh, New York, they don't care about authority. But the people in the South care a lot about authority. So this is a totally really dangerous map, and we have to take it down. And uh, we were forced to do uh, this for Ukraine instead. So this is not Ukrainian map. As you can see, the uh, there's a high correlation between conflict events and uh, human's model value, uh, something like authority and power. Okay, so I hope I'll give you enough motivation why the logic of construction from unstructured data to multiple multimedia is useful. And then uh, we are so tired about you know applying this to disasters and uh, like internal analysis because actually we don't see the feedback, right? We don't see impact. We don't know what kind of things they're using or techniques for. So that's why I start to think about whether we can actually help our ourselves, right? So as we all know, uh, when we were kids, <laughs> school is kind of a really happy place, right? Everyone just enjoy ourselves. And uh, so now, uh, if we look at uh, our um, kids in college and the very school, we suffer a lot from um, research and uh, and, uh, and uh, learning things because there's so many things to read. Um, so I was talking to some students yesterday. We were uh, guess my how many papers are showing in your tweets uh, every morning I have an archive and completion of these papers. Maybe hundreds or sometimes maybe uh, you know fifty, that's like um, normal size. But if you look at the um, the, the day you know, after say email key time ready, you will see like maybe three hundred or four hundred archive papers you see. So just too much. We don't have time. So um in so this is a much more serious problem in public uh, Domain, so public biometric domain. Each year, um, they will. So th this is just rough count. More than 1.2 million in papers are published in 2016 alone, and uh, nowadays in total there are about 26 million papers. Uh, so humans reading ability, and if you do a survey, we can only read at most 264 papers at each year. So that actually requires you almost read one paper each day, right? And none of my can do that. And this kind of ability is stable, so it's, we are not uh, we, have, we are not able to catch up with the number of the papers. So numbers increase almost in exponential way, but our ability is stable; it's always the same. So that's a problem because we are missing a lot of information. So actually, in a lot of the um, so I'll talk to you in the morning. So we we'll say in a lot of the uh, labs and, uh, in um, biochemistry, you know, departments. The, the real problem is because each experiment is so expensive, and if you don't know the other lab, you know, in Harvard or Japan is doing the same thing as what you are thinking, then you're wasting money, you are wasting time. And uh, if you get uh, the same hypothesis, you cannot publish paper. But if you get uh, a different hypothesis, you will have to check uh, you know, what's going wrong. So it's it's just very, um, uh, it's not economic. <laughs> it, it's, it's too costly, right? And uh, the other problem is um, because of the overwhelming information, it's very really difficult for scientists to really pick out the new hypothesis or normal ideas because they are so blind about what's going on. So a lot of the work they have been doing in this domain mm -hmm. is kind of incremental work. So this is some number that uh, people actually did some manual analysis. So they would look at the 6.4 million papers manually check whether it's uh, incremental or normal. Uh, 
and uh, they reported that 60% of these papers are being used for right. So it's, it's depressing because <laughs> that means 60% of the uh, maybe PhD students wasted their five years time just doing uh, some really incremental work, right? It's not good. And then um, maybe another bad problem is about the writing. So um, I don't remember how much time I spent on translating my students' slides into papers because a lot of students are so good at implementing uh, fancy models and uh, even auto communication, but they're really, really bad writers. I, I'm, I myself was a very bad writer. When I was in, I'm still bad, but I was much worse when I was a student. So it's a pain for advisors, right? And it's also a pain for your for students because they are not able to communicate what they did in a logical way, in a clear way. Right? Um, so this paper, so Pinker, uh, this paper, they read a lot, lots of papers, and the conclusion is that although these are great scientists, they have a good mind, but they are writing things. So things is really serious word in English. It not only is it's bad, but it's like disgusting, right? So a lot of papers are very, very, very bad. Um, so we would like to automate the knowledge graph construction and then create new ideas and also writing. But of course, because we cannot let the robot do the experiments, so the automated process can only be applied to introduction, abstract, and the conclusion of each work. So we want to get a, a title from a scientist, and then we look at the knowledge graph. Try to find the background knowledge and do link prediction. Try to enrich the idea and then write the abstract and then use the abstract as input, write the conclusion of future work discussion, and then from future work we'll create a new title. So this is how like the self-production process. Okay. So I want to make it clear that we are not trying to generate fake papers. I mean we are trying to make an assistant that can help scientists. Okay. So I uh, think yesterday in the panel we discussed like you know. Whether AI is dangerous really depends on who is using it, right? So we are definitely not advocating this is a machine to generate papers. That's definitely not going to go. I know uh, some students actually asked me when we submitted this uh, paper uh, about output to any conference. We did not, okay? So we actually wanted to tease some fake conferences in that way. But the problem is because the fake conferences, they want to get money. So we need to generate authors, ablations. I know we cannot do that because we, we don't know how to automatically generate uh, authors and ablations. And we don't want our colleagues to pay for the fake papers. So we didn't try. But actually, if we try that, it's an automatic way to evaluate, right? Because, you know, reviewers will say we accept the paper or not. Anyway, so this is a whole framework. Um, for all the papers, we use knowledge extraction, and I will tell you how we do each step, like how can we uh, extract entities and then relations and events step by step. And then we build the knowledge graph. And then uh, using the older paper, we can then do link prediction because the knowledge graph on these papers, they are still not complete. Um, you will miss some links. So we did automatic link prediction. It's like uh, when we read a lot of papers, we do our literature survey, and then you will find the new connections. For example, you uh, saw a paper about using LSTM for uh, past speech tagging, and in your mind, you know past speech tagging is similar to name tagging yeah, because they are both some kind of sequence labeling problem. And then you can write a new paper and say, I'm going to use LSTM for name tagging. So the similar idea for link prediction. And then the writing part, we uh, so as, as I said, we need a human title as input. And then we go to check this knowledge, knowledge graph to see what entities are related to the entities in the title. And then we feed that as input into a memory network. And memory network actually takes three things as input. One is the language model trained from old papers. So we try to learn what, how to write a paper. And the second thing is the entities in the title. And the third one is the type entities we predicted from the background knowledge graph. Okay. And uh, then the, this uh, GRU is going to assign different weights to the three inputs and then generate an uh, abstract. So this is the same pipeline. Uh, so here I'm using example if the type as inputs and abstract. But then in next iteration, you can use abstract to as, as input and then generate conclusion future work. And then Finally, using future work as input to generate a new title. <coughs> so let me uh, start talking about how can we uh, build the knowledge graph. So this is just some examples. So the, the, here we can see some sentences from the paper, and uh, this is the uh, one example of a knowledge graph. So you can see each node can be a gene, plotting or the list, and then each edge 
uh, is some sort of relations to show you how their different entities are interacting with each other. So one big problem in scientific literature is they assume the readers also know about the domain, are also scientists. So they don't bother to explain the terminology. They would just use some abbreviation like P53, okay? And they assume the readers know what they mean. So P53, it's very hard for a embedding model or ejection model to comprehend because it, it doesn't have any context to explain what it is. You know, even for Obama, we have some titles that can indicate its person, right? But for P53, they just tell you what P53 was doing in some sort of interaction. So that's why we want to enrich this uh, context by linking the concept to external ontologies. So we collect 300 bio ontologies by, from BioPortal, and then we, do, we implemented a uh, end linker to link these concepts to external ontologies, and then we can use that as additional information to do better uh, link prediction and uh, relation event interaction. Okay. okay, so let me talk about these three components. So the first component is about how, uh, how can we find the entities and how we link to ontologies. So um, here we actually use a, a kind of semi-supervised way to do the anti ejection because um, although uh, we have very limited annotation for entities uh, in biomedical domain, but the ontologies actually can tell you a lot about the what type is. For example, if we are able to link HER2 to ontology, then ontology can see this deep path can tell you the fine going types. Depends on what you want. So it can tell you this is a path going from the ERBD2 is uh, the most fine going type for HER2. And then the next level is proto on called genes. And then final, the root type is mesh descriptors. So uh, you can just use the whole path as the type for the entity, right? So now the problem is how can we know this HER2 should be linked to that entry in ontology? Right? Because, like I said, it's very ambiguous and um, the content doesn't tell you enough information. So, what we did here is we used abstract meaning representation parser, it's called AMR parser. I really want to advocate this uh, coverage. So, how many people heard about AMR? Very few, okay. How many people heard about symmetric role labeling? On your class, right? So, so symmetric role labeling, labeling basically try to decorate the passing tree, tell you, you know, which entity play what kind of symmetric role, right? Uh, in an in a event. For example, if I say, you know, Mary hit John, or John was hit by Mary, then the symmetric role of uh, Mary is the same in these two sentences, especially she's attacker. So AMR is extended version of symmetric role labeling, because in symmetric role labeling, you only care about agent and who receive the action. But in AMR, they define about 140 roles. Okay? So it's much more fine grain. So we try to apply AMR parser to this sentence. And the good thing is they actually have a human annotated AMR parser for biomedical domain. So you can train a very reliable AMR parser from those human applications. So AMR parser will tell us there's relation uh, between the, this, uh, this entity, PHER3, and effects. And the, this PHER3 plays as arg1, which means PHER3 received this action, um, OK? And then uh, it also tell you, for example, there's a uh, conjunction relation between HER2 and HER3 because they are involved in the uh, comma, comma, and uh, structure. So it's kind of a combination of synthetic structure and the semantic parsing results. Is that clear so far? So we, we run this AMR parse as a preprocessing. And then uh, for each entity mentioned, if we are able to link that to external ontology, then we use this path as the type for HER2. And if we know HER2 and HER3 are similar, then we can also propagate the, this type to HER3. So there are two steps. First of all, we try to link each mention to external ontology. And the second step is to use the context to cluster meshes together. And we assume each member in a cluster will share some sort of a type. Is that clear? Okay, so let me talk about how can we represent the, um, the meaning. So, like I said, it's very complicated because the scientific literature, the sentence structure is complicated, and also the entity itself is highly ambiguous. So what we decide to do is not only just use the mention, the words, phrases itself to represent the meaning, we also want to use this AMR parsing structure to give us a richer context to represent each entity. So let me give you an example. So in that sentence, uh, 
after we run MR parser, we'll get a tree, a uh, sentences hypergraph for MR parser. So you can see here, this HDR2, HDR3, PHDR3, these are the, uh, they are involved in conjunction structure. So it's OP1, OP2, OP3. So these are symmetrical rows, okay? And you can see there's a relation between the effect. So effect is normalized as a fetch event. And uh, these three guys, they play as arc one of the effect, okay? So you can think of this as a tool to convert a sentence into a semantic graph like this. Why is this useful? Because this can help us determine which nodes are related to decide the meaning of each entity. For example, now I clearly know if I want to de de decide the type for HER3, I should use uh, the representation for HER2, HER3, and I should also borrow some meaning of the fact. So it's like dependency parsing. It helps you to compress the long, wide uh, context into shorter distance. Because if you look at the original sentence, it's very complicated, and you have no idea which words here should help me to decide the type for the PHES3. But from EMR parser, you clearly know I should use HER2, HER3, and the word effect, because only those words and entities are related to me in the, in the uh, passing output. Is that clear? Okay, so, um, and if you don't like this complicated MR parser, you can always use symmetrical labeling, and that will still give you some idea about which local neighbors should be used to use the meaning, okay? So, after we do that, then we will basically generate a vector for each node, for each entity. So, you, uh, for PHER3, you have a vector, and then you also use the neighbor, uh, uh, HER2, HER3, and the effect as a concatenation um, and then you can get a, a longer vector for, for each entity. Okay, and then from these vectors, we can do hierarchical clustering, then we get a cluster. And then uh, we link uh, HER3, HER2, PHER3 to external ontologies. And then as a collective effort, we try to decide what the type should be assigned to each entity cluster. Okay, so how can we do interlinking? <coughs> the way to do interlinking is very simple. We look at three measures. Salience, similarity, and coherence as what we usually see in anti-linking literature. So salience means how popular my candidate is in ontology. Okay? So for example, now I want to decide which node in the uh, ontology is a candidate for, say, IL6. So this is the graph we constructed from the sentence itself. Okay? Um, and now the salience means how many times IL6 is linked by other entries if it's more Frequent, that means it's a popular candidate. Okay. And the similarity, we check how many times the neighbors of IL6 are overlapping with the neighbors of IL6 in the ontology side. For example, here, tissue is similar to adipose tissue, and then STAT3 is similar to activated STAT3. So that's a good um, indication saying that IL6 is the candidate entity of IL6. So similarity based looking at how many neighbors are overlapping. And then coherence, coherence means if I have two mentions, for example, IL6 and STEM3 appear together in one sentence. So I prefer the entity candidates in ontology are also strongly connected to each other. So that's why we pick the activity STEM3 and IL6 as the final entity candidates. Is that clear? So it's the same as what we usually do in news domain. You know, if you want to decide who is Obama in the sentence and who is, uh, say, Biden in the sentence. And if you see Barack Obama and Joe Biden or Kennedy in Wikipedia, then those two are good entity candidates. So it's the same idea here. Okay. And that's what we can do the anti-linking in an unsupervised fashion without using any annotation. Okay, and then for relation events, we will have to rely on annotation because there's no way for you to do clustering and do type. So for relation rejection, we use some human annotation data, for example, in this experiment to use the drug job interaction. So this is a, so we basically created all the annotations from that by uh, you know, P community. They have tons of shared tests for relation event rejection. So we just collect them. And uh, the only thing I want to point out here is it's really important to uh, use the bio word embedding <laughs> because it just gives you a better representation. And uh, it's really important to do the identification and classification for relations in multi-textology. Multi um, so the more interesting thing I want to point out is for event. So the difference, big difference 
uh, between biomedical event and the news event is in biomedical events, you can use another event as your argument. Okay? So here you can see it says control the expression of something, something. So expression itself is the event. Okay? And this event serves as a thin argument for this regulation event. So we don't see this kind of phenomenon in news. We want to say, you know, I I attacked uh, an arrest event. We don't say that, right? But in biomedical literature, this happens a lot. So what does that mean? That means you really need to figure out the syntactic structure and figure out which entities are playing what kind of role and which events are playing what kind of role in another event. So we need better analysis of the structure and a smarter way to leverage that. Okay. So what we did is we uh, again used the, uh, so in this case, we used the tennis parser so that we know uh, this, for example, this text is, has a potential dependency ratio with transduced. So this can be a good entity argument. However, because like I said, because it's not designed or written for experts, <laughs> So if we just look at the bioverting value for text, you still don't know what kind of role text played in this translation event. Mm. Because when experts read the article, they not only read the sentence, they have verbal knowledge in their brain. They know that text usually is a positive regulation of transcription. Okay? So how can we teach a model to learn that kind of verbal knowledge? So our idea is let's use anti-linking. Let's link this mention to ontology, and let's just use everything written in ontology as our additional content. So in ontology, you can see there's a type category says this is protein, and it also tells us it's DNA templated is playing as a possible regulation of transcription. So because in the description it shows possible regulation, that's a good feature to tell us maybe this text is the same for this transduction event. So of course we, we need a more elegant way to take advantage of this additional description, but for now we just consider that description as additional content. So what we did is we use the two vectors. So here you have the sentence embedding, and then you use the type embedding coming from the ontology, and then you, you have another layer of word embedding coming from the description. And then uh, we have one classifier to determine the trigger labeling. So for each verb, you try to decide what event type is using these three uh, uh, features. And uh, so we use a tree LSTM. So tree LSTM can capture the dependence tree structure. And uh, we call this a KB driven because your input is not just the sentence embedding, you also have the description from ontology. Um, and then after we do trigger labeling, we go ahead to do acumulative labeling. So we use the event type as input, and then you can decide the roles each entity played in the uh, uh, events for each event. Is that clear? Okay. So uh, compared to the other baselines, uh, so uh, the numbers are quite decent, actually, I would have to say, compared to news mm -hmm. events. Uh, the thing I want to point out is compared to the model that does not use any uh, KB embedding, we got much better results. So you can look at this number and this number. Um, and the, the most difficult challenging cases are still about those events that are using another event as arguments. Okay. If the event only uses entities as arguments, so we get a lot of improvement. We can compare these results and um, simple total and simple total. But, uh, if you look at the more difficult challenge cases, our performance is still much worse than um, the events using only entities. So the more challenging cases are the regulation ones, where there's another action being regulated. Is that right? Yeah. So because the regulation always use other, for some control event as its uh, argument, um, okay. and also sometimes even for humans, it's really difficult to distinguish possible negative. They need uh, more background knowledge. Uh, so we try to visualize the uh, attentions for uh, for the features and just to show how much the KB side, the end link is helping us. So again, here, you know, if you don't use the uh, description for this uh, entity called OBF1, it's really difficult to decide the role of OBF1 in this uh, event because it's far away from the event trigger. But if we use anti linking, then anti linking says, the function description possible regulation of transcription DA template. This is the description for OBF1 
and then this includes words like uh, transcription. So that helps our model to decide the role of this uh, protein played in this uh, transcription event. Yeah. And it, as you can see from the, uh, the visualized results, this word transcription now has very high weight connected to this entity. Okay, so that's about the ejection. Uh, so what we found is if you only do this entity relation event ejection, then the graph is still quite sparse. Uh, so we did a simple link prediction. So the idea is if I see two nodes like Zinc and Helsing, <coughs> they share a lot of neighbors in the notch graph. So they share three neighbors. And in the text side, their text embedding also are similar. Then we decided they are similar. And I'm going to propagate with uh, Zinc's neighbor to be neighbor of this housing. So this dash lines are predictor links. Okay, pretty simple, simple idea. You basically compare every two nodes about two things. One is their graph embedding, the other one is text embedding. And if they're similar enough, you're going to propagate A's neighbor to B and B's neighbor to A. Okay, so to just give you a little bit more details about how we do the inquisition. So we have uh, this representation from a notch graph. Uh, so this look at all its neighbors to represent each node. And then you also look at all the um, uh, other words in the sentence. And uh, also this is only the notch graph structure. So uh, because each node, each neighbor is linked to this kind of node with a different, different types of edges, for example, think has increased privilege with this one, but it has a decreased expression with this one. So we use multi-head attention so that you can assign in the weights to these links. So your neighbors basically play different types of roles when they try to help represent think. Does that make sense? So if, for example, if a decreasing expression appears more frequently than increased cleavage, and then this neighbor will have higher weights when we use multi-head attention to represent think. Okay. And then uh, for the text embedding, we use a similar idea, but we use a value dimensional uh, uh, LSTM so that you can use a whole sentence to represent the entity. So using this example, you can see the whole sentence we, after we do a value LSTM will give a representation for each entity in the sentence. So you can see the Kelsey and the Zinc will sh be sharing very similar Representations. So the reason we still need the text embedding is because if you only rely on the not graph, because our IE system, the entity relation event uh, components are not perfect. So there will be a lot of errors. You know, maybe many of the neighbors should not be your neighbors. So that's why we still use uh, some uh, text content embedding to help us uh, better represent each node. Okay. okay, so that link prediction results actually tell us some new ideas. And then we have three things now. We have the typo as input. And uh, from the typo, we did the entity relation event ejection, so we know the entities. And mm -hmm. then from the link prediction, we know which entities are related to the entities in the typo, right? So, and then we have another input is a language model you can learn from 10 million papers, right? Because a lot, a lot of our writing is really about repeating our campus. You know, once you have paper, um, to ACL, your advisor helped you collect a lot of grammatical errors. And next time, you can just use the same template you know, for the introduction. And you try to avoid the same type of errors. So that's the same idea. OK, so use these three things and then use GRU. We can just uh, generate a uh, abstract, a conclusion, future work, and a title. But the biggest problem is <laughs> natural language generation based on neural, net <laughs> neural network models always have trouble mm -hmm. at generating long sentences. Why? Because it starts to lose focus, right? And it starts to generate very, uh, really uh, redundant words and uh, terms because attention usually is assigned to those frequent uh, and dominant words. So we have seen a lot, a lot of repetition in, in our results, which is not good. So what we did is we used a very simple strategy. Instead of generating one word each time, we generated four. So it's a bean, okay? And then from these four, we try to pick up the one that's most dominant, but it, it was not generated in the same sentence. So we try to aggressively avoid repetition. Okay, so here are some examples output. So this is the human generated abstract title, conclusion, future work, and new title. So assume the new title, because this new title cites this paper. So we assume that's a new title inspired from this conclusion, future work. 
So this will be the input and output pair for training. Okay. Um, and this is system output. So you can see they look very different, but if you look at the entities highlighted in the abstract, they are all very similar. And they are also uh, coherent and consistent with what's uh, in the input, in the title. And then we ask the scientists to edit this abstract until they feel like it's publishable, okay? So this is a post edited by human, and you can see they only did some stylist edits. So if you look at the blue score between this one and this one, the scores are quite good. You can see even for blue four, we have about 54 or 55 um, blue percent, right? Uh, and it only took them about 40 minutes to edit 50 abstracts. But of course, they, didn't, they were not able to validate themselves, right? The numbers are still fake, but uh, they are pretty well written and uh, you know, they saved them a lot of time. Um, and uh, here shows some diagnostic analysis. So how much linking prediction helps you? So if you look at the without link prediction, so this one shows without memory network, that means if you don't do knowledge graph, uh, then it's kind of off topic because the number of uh, related entities are much fewer than, uh, much smaller than the final system. And if you don't do link prediction, you just don't get uh, interesting ideas. Uh, and if you don't do the repetition removal, you can see a lot of the repeated words like smell and left spin, right? So it's worse than the final output. Okay, and uh, I just want to show more example about repetition removal. So if you, we found that uh, after we do the bin search, we not only remove the repetition, but also the, I, the output is more interesting because, you know, once you pick up diverse words and it start to generate more interesting uh, different uh, coping the topic. And the original model without the repetition removal just keeps saying the same idea, the same concept. This is another example of the without the repetition removal, you see MI interesting many times. Okay, so how do we do evaluation, right? So I'm not super happy about what we did, but <laughs> this is uh, we tried our best. So we collect a lot of data from all the PNC, uh, which is a, um, a subset of comments. Um, and they have, they have clean the data. And for, uh, for the writing, we picked up some, uh, so we split that into training and direct test. Um, so first of all, we did automatic evaluation. I mean, you should not read anything um, too much into the result because these matches, they're all very bad. Okay? But uh, if you look at the complexity, we can see, uh, you compare to the previous state of the art models, our model, the language model part has a much lower complexity. So that means that we are learning good language model, more fluent. And the media scores are usually higher than state of the methods. But please don't read anything to this output. It doesn't make any sense. So we did tuning test for as a uh, form of evaluation. So what we did is we present a pair of the system output and the human output to expert. Okay, so this expert is a real expert. Who actually is a professor. <laughs> he spent his whole career doing this topic in nanotechnology. Okay, so pick so PubMed is really diverse. It covers lots of different topics. So if you ask a hard disease expert to read the nanotechnology, this person won't understand <laughs> that good. So we just pick one topic, and we ask this person to do tuning test. So if this person mistakenly pick the system output as a better output, then uh, that means we pass to the test. Okay. So this this is a part of passing rate. You can see we can have up to thirty percent passing rate. So that means up to 30% times, the expert could not distinguish the system output and the human output. Actually, the expert think the system output is better. So okay. that is the case when you have the same title yeah. and you're producing the abstract and contrasting the original abstract versus the generated abstract. Yeah, so we did a different setting. So we, we tried a different title or same title, different to abstract or same abstract. So uh, you can see usually for, actually, Actually, for uh, so for example, for, for when we have abstract and general conclusion fusion work, when we use the same abstract, the passing rate is even higher. But uh, you can, but for title as input, the um, yeah. So so because for different title, uh, usually the system one is uh, looks obviously worse than the human one. And when they, uh, when they actually check the same title, they sometimes think the system written one is more grammatically correct, actually more interesting, so the possibility is actually higher. And we also show this to any non-experts. 
So now as for as the NLP students, they don't they, they know nothing about the results. They mainly check the English. So you can see, uh, I mean, it's not much better or uh, maybe score not not much higher than expert. So they just look at the different aspects. So let me show some quick examples. So this one is about uh, giving uh, the same title and generating abstracts. So you can, you know, spend some seconds to look at A and B and tell me which one do you think is the um, robot for the system? Because it's shorter? No, because it has background Z and the, the capital T. Um, <laughs> um, I think that's just uh, some text cleaning thing, yeah. Are you sure it's A? No. How many do you think it's B? Yeah, actually, this one is easy. It's, it's A because uh, if you look at the number here, so 25 oh. becomes 50 and the 10 becomes 100 because this is from language model. So you can see it's a long mass. So you can, and it also it's shorter. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So this one, there are similar lengths. A or B is from system. I have to say A's grammar is bad. It's language is really awkward. It's like it's an attractive proposition. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> language is really awkward. Um how many people think it's A? A is what? Uh, uh, system of system. System. So I mean, you think it's B? I think B is the system. Why? Because it, it reads better. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that's how uh, NLP, if you're an NLP system developer, you usually prefer the, way to put it that you prefer the batch of grammar because you know you have used uh, 10 million documents for changing language model, right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, but the real reason, yeah, it's B, you're correct, but the real reason is because B doesn't really give you any concrete information. So it says like the probability outcome was established by using a scoring system. But we don't, I mean, if a human write the abstract, you should say what scoring system, right? Um, so it's really generic. Okay, how about conclusion? So conclusion, usually people, read, human reading conclusion are boring. <laughs> I mean, in NLP papers, we usually repeat what we wrote in abstract, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, reviews usually so don't care about the conclusion. So. Which one is the best system? A. A, why? Because using summary, maybe that is a frequent feature that is learned from the existing conclusions. Oh, okay. Interesting. That's a very interesting angle. Yes, you're right. Um, but I think the main reason here is uh, actually the, uh, the so expert says this is just wrong. I mean, the EMT energy. HG of DI is just a wrong combination or something. I mean, we really need some domain knowledge to judge. How about the, this one? Do you think a B is a bad robot? Because that's in summary. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell, right? You can let it over this again. A, Y. Very generic. Maybe. So it's actually B. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, this one needs some background knowledge because uh, EBR is not a disease or something. It's a, so it's just a long type of a concept to be put into this uh, language model. Uh, okay, maybe a few more and then uh, I will show some other results. <laughs> so this one both are very concrete and uh, you can see they are already on topic because they're talking about the uh, BM. EMP2 signaling. You can see actually uh, one clue is uh, when I was doing the tooling test, I, I find the um, you can see language model. So the system generation one usually is more assertive, like very confident about the claim. <laughs> so this one is B. Um, I actually don't remember why it's B. I think it's because uh, this, this is not a right claim. Um, Oh, oh, and also because it didn't say, it tell you what the disease it is. It just says the treatment of the disease and then period. It's just weird. Um, okay, uh, this one, I'm just going to go through this quickly. So this one is a B, although it's longer. Again, it's, uh, it didn't say 
what cancer, because it uh, just says the development of cancer. Okay. So in general, I think, oh, and this is title. So which one do you think it's like to be right? Which one is more interesting? <laughs> that it should be written by human, right? Okay. So A is uh, written by a human, just because B is uh, longer and uh, has, is more interesting, like have uh, more concrete information. Okay. And this one, again, similarly is A, because uh, B is more concrete, and A just is very general, like the treatment of something. And it says a systematic review and meta-analysis, but you can use this phrase for almost all the papers, right? Yeah. Okay, so the main challenge, like we have seen, you know, one pro problem is a human generated thing is usually more vivid. Uh, sometimes they even use a question mark, right? But because this kind of a, uh, question mark uh, titles don't appear in our training data much, so our model is not able to generate any question uh, sentences as a title. And also, human author is always more concrete. Like this one, a human written title is a, um, very, very um, informative. A system written title, just a review of the literature. <laughs> Not very interesting. Okay, so a general question is uh, uh, um, like whether it works for other domains, right? So, of course, because uh, we are NLP researchers, we want to see whether this can help ourselves, right? So, we we uh, collect all the papers from ACL authority and we train and we basically use the same framework from NLP domain. However, it didn't work. <laughs> well, we put some numbers uh, in that paper, but uh, Actually, uh, it just doesn't work uh, very well. So the one reason is because we are not publishing enough. So language model is not able to basically uh, copy those out of the heavy words. And so it's very generic. So for example, this is a title generated from the model. It says, statistics based on hybrid approach to Chinese-based phrase identification. Right? It didn't tell you what method it is. It only says like, some kind of statistical-based method. And abstract says, um, Describe a novel approach to the task of the Chinese based race application. We use the something sounds of Chinese parser. But it didn't say what novel approach is. Just because, you know, there the, the out of vocabulary, like new tools, like new tools just don't appear now. The entities don't appear now in the in the training data. So we are not able to capture interesting campaigns. And the other problem is that our our relations are not interesting. They are very cost grained So we don't have like, you know, job to job introduction, right? We, we, at most, we have something like a method and a, a task, and the method is used to solve the task, right? So that's why when we look at the link prediction, the entity link prediction is usually not accurate because we don't have heterogeneous types for, for, the, for that graph. So for example, when we have an input uh, title, which is the injecting molecular binding relationships from biomedical test, okay, so this is input title. And uh, the system generated abstract is a mentioned prologue program. So this prologue program was mistakenly identified as a related entity with a uh, medical text. So just because we don't have the enough uh, which is that uh, relation types. Okay, so one of the ongoing work is uh, we are doing review robot. Because <laughs> I I don't know, maybe starting from 2013, uh, uh, I think just for some reason over my Best papers, best paper submissions always got rejected for the first time. Like all the papers that are accepted for the first time are on my worst papers and most boring papers, right? And the, the reviews are just becoming worse and worse. I don't know whether you guys have the same observation. So this is what we got from one of the submission, like uh, from MLP 2019. So the uh, this uh, reviewer he just write these three bullets, right? So the reasons to accept. Idea is interesting and convincing. And second, the sort of experiments are conducted. And then reason to reject the idea is too simple and tricky. What, what does that mean? <laughs> simple and tricky. <laughs> so I didn't tell us anything. And then uh, if you look at so me and the Regina the, the, the did this experiment and the, uh, in your report you show that in this 2016 they did an experiment. So basically as a true independent set of reviews, reveal the same set of papers. And the agreement is only about uh, like a uh, how much, uh, I don't remember, half, right? So half of papers that are accepted would have been rejected if it's, they are reviewed by a different group of people. Anyway, um, so we want to, <laughs> a fake <laughs> review to help human review to write more informative 
uh, reveals. Because if you want to reject us, if you say it's too simple, you need to tell us why it's too simple. What other methods are the alternative methods? That's not simple, right? And if you say it's not novel, you need to tell us what other papers we didn't forgot, we forgot to cite. You need to give us justification, right? So again, I'm not saying we are going to populate a lot of fake reviews. We want this to be an assistant to really teach the reviews, you know, here are the papers you have missed, and here are the results you need to compare when you're reviewing this paper. Okay, so what we have done so far is that we decided to do two steps. One is we want to predict the scores for each category, um, and then based on the scores, we decide what to write for each category, okay? So we take the, so uh, this is a nice data set that we have from ACL 2017, uh, and we, it's a reasonable data set, but uh, we uh, split that into uh, some training clip that test. And for each category, we simply trained a GIO with attention, and uh, we just used uh, all the words in the, paper, in the paper content as input feature, okay? So, and then we use ground truth based on the average score uh, from three review, human reviewers. Uh, and of course, we did some uh, wrong. For example, if the average score is 3.67, then we think that's four, okay? So the accuracy basically checks how many times the system produced score overlap with the average score. So the interesting thing here is you can, see, if you look at overall recommendation, it's very close to the human um, internet agreement, okay? So that means about overall recommendation, we can already do this automatically. Um, but for some categories, for example, soundness, uh, human usually agree with each other, but we, we did a very bad thing because soundness, it's not just about reading words in the, in the sentence and document. You need to look at the background knowledge. So we didn't do that part yet. Clarity, surprisingly, you know, human agree very well and the system didn't predict the clarity. I don't know. So one problem that I when was uh, talking to me is means that maybe the input training data is bad. Maybe we should use high quality reviews for training model, right? Because um, even a paper is accepted, not, that does not mean all the reviews have high quality. So we are thinking about maybe we should use uh, the open review um, because each review has a rate for the authors. Maybe we change the model. Okay, and the other ongoing work we are doing is about automatic ID generation. <coughs> so I showed the link prediction, but that's pretty incremental, work, right? So it's, incremental work is not good. I mean, it's okay for normal people, it's not good for biomedical. So how about we generate the whole graph automatically? How about we just start on node? It's like a student that comes to the office and say, I want to work on MPEG. That's just node. And that's generic idea of me. So people have done this actually, right? So in this group from Stanford, they try to predict drug drug interaction based on 150 small instances, graph instances. So what they did is pretty nice. They, this is one of the most exciting ideas I've seen in the past five years. So they flatten the graph in the sequence. So for example, on, for this graph, they will show, you know, you first start from uh, five nodes and then you start to attach node. So it's like if, if you have a triangle, three nodes, you start from one node, and then next word is basically two nodes, and then next word is three nodes. It's like how we generate a sentence in language. So it basically flatten the graph in a sequence. And then you can just train language model based on that to flatten the graph. Does that make sense? How so, do you decide the order of the uh, Question. I think they uh, they they, in, in, they did a random initialization and uh, the graph. I think they uh, I think it's random because it, uh, in that case it's random because the ed, they don't have edge label. Uh, they don't have edge label, so they don't have relations. And the, the node type it's only one. Oh, maybe three types. Yeah, I don't remember. I should check. With I don't remember how they uh, decide the or the typological order. But I, I know their uh, initialization is random, I mean, it's initialization mode. So, but for us, we, we do have relation type, right? It's heterogeneous, so, and we have a lot more graphs. So what I was thinking, what we are doing now is we try to do the, use the same idea. So flatten the knowledge graph constructed from 10 million papers. And then, uh, so I'm, I, I, I decided to, I probably will sell myself to Amazon so I can use their machines to train this huge graph language model. And then we can generate ideas. So uh, we are facing two bottlenecks now. One is the, the, the size of graphs is much bigger than what they have. Mm -hmm. And the other one is we have the 140 relation types. We really want to take advantage of that. I'm oh, sorry, 133. Uh, because in that case, they, they don't have the label here, OK? OK, so, uh, so takeaway, OK? Again, I want to 
basically do a big disclaimer. I'm not saying we should do fake science. <laughs> but we, we just want, I just want to say the original goal of knowledge discovery is to discover knowledge, right? But we have been using that for many other applications, but we, we need to think about the use that to help ourselves. So now is the time because we have this powerful IE algorithms and we have some so some, so so big data, especially for PubMed domain. Um, so it's a very promising application. And uh, if you really work with the biologists, they can help you demonstrate the, the impact. For example, if you suggest a path going from one protein to another gene and then go to another disease, they can actually verify that using real experiments. So uh, it's much more interesting than you know MH17 crash, right? <laughs> Who knows what happened? So I really think it's a, it's a new direction that we should have put more research efforts. So um, in terms of the you know future directions, I already talked about two, but uh, I think in gen generally we still need to have a better machine learning model to explore the background knowledge from purges. Because now we only look at the description and type, but we didn't look at, for example, how can we use the tree embedding, the hierarchy, and then we need to look at uh, how can we um, combine the structure representation from AML passing together with embedding, because now we only use the semantic passing to select the local content words, and we should be able to combine that structure itself with the embedding representation machine. Uh, okay, so this is the code. Uh, there are already a lot of downloads, so we're going to try the review about that. Uh, it's any kind of review about that because we're still working on that. Uh, okay, I think, yeah, thank you. That's it. Okay, so we have time for questions. Do we? Okay, a guy named Andrew Redmond lost at the kidding. The decision reviewers that uh, attack the subject, okay, uh, you mean you miss out on this uh, very important uh, reference that I'm ever going to reflect on. Yeah. So, you, is there any way that the, Yeah, we, we want to generate that automatically. So, if the novelty score is lower than three, then the next step is to check our background knowledge graph. And, uh, for example, if there's already a link between chaos and name tagging, and if this paper is about that, then you can say, oh, and then check the, the uh, rating work session, and then say, you, you forgot to cite this, and you list this um, paper title. So uh, the paper work can, can jump whether a sentence was cited or So we are thinking to compare on knowledge element level instead of sentence level. So, so, so basically, you're reviewing your paper, you have small knowledge graph for this paper, and then you just check uh, whether in the bigger, bigger NLP knowledge graph, whether you can see the same link or the same uh, triples or the subgraph. If you already see a lot of cases and if this paper did not cite that one, then you should list all these red papers. I mean, I don't know how, how long it would take us to finish this, but I'm really hoping if it's useful, then we will work with, it, for example, Softcom to integrate this as a tool. But if you guys can help me out, then we can maybe speed up this uh, development. We are doing this for, for nothing, for, for free. I mean, I, no, no one will fund this, right? <laughs> <laughs> because scientists are not that important compared to, I don't know, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I, I mean, if you guys have interest, I know many of you are working on biomedical domain, so we should work together. Um, the reason we start from NLP for the view about is because we can manually check the and you know, analyze results. One pain that I have when I was looking at the paper report, of course, I cannot know what happened in the error side. I don't know how you guys think. Because we have some collaborators in the UCLA hospital, but they only are experts on heart disease. So it's very painful to chase back where the errors come from. I mean, this, uh, I'm familiar with some proteins, but still many of them are like foreign language to me. But unfortunately, NLP domain does not have enough paper. We have enough paper, but we don't have a free access to a digital library of those papers. So. Other questions? Yeah. I'm very curious about how you choose your reference paper when you are constructing a KG. Uh, I mean, when you are generating a new paper, you have this reference polygraph. The polygraph is constructed with some, uh, you chose the papers. Uh, is the papers different oh, for the Interesting. Audience? No, not yet. But uh, we should do that, right? Yeah, we should do that. We definitely should do that. So, 
So if I want to kind of repeat the question, so the country that we only have one uniform big knowledge graph, but ideally, for example, when we work on parsing, we should, I mean, the student only needs to build a background knowledge graph about parsing or related uh, topic, maybe, maybe, you know, don't need to input dialogue, right? So ideally, we should do topic categorization and then automatically get a subset to build a, the reference background knowledge graph. We didn't do that yet, but that's a great idea. We should do that. That's a very automatic, automatic way to do that. Yeah, it's really hard because you know for NLP, many of our new ideas are inspired from computer vision, right? So that, that means you should also read some completely irrelevant topics. <laughs> it's hard to decide, so, yeah. but that can help speed up the the link prediction and maybe make the representation more accurate. Because like I said, you know, a lot of the applications they appear in multiple domains and they actually refer to different entities. Is it possible to extract the knowledge that you build? So to help you put a summary of the idea of your question I'm sorry, can you say again? It sounds yeah. very exciting. Extract the, the knowledge that the system is built. So if, system is for example, if I'm looking into a specific section, I want to see the available. Yeah. And extract from the system like a summary of that available and see what kind of value that's been done in that area. Oh, like what? What a unexplored uh, areas, right? So, like, can I paraphrase? So the yeah. idea is to take a, a block of text that you've already written and then use oh. the system to pull up related yeah. work. Yeah, maybe oh. some keywords. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, so that's ready work session generation. Yeah, yeah. So, some people have already worked on that, uh, but uh, I think they would mainly look at a citation network. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Please feel free to work on that. <laughs> we, we only work on abstract and uh, conclusion uh, session, uh, but uh, yeah, we should. I, I think the reading work session is, uh, has great potential to become assistant because uh, we spend. You know, I don't know how you guys do it, but usually I write the reading session at the end, and then sometimes I go, "Oh, I forgot this this one," and you know, it, it make our claim introduction uh, to 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 match actually rewrite the introduction. So it would be really helpful if we can have that automatically written, um, you know, especially the paper robot can read the papers faster, right? So yeah, and uh, there's a lot of technical work uh, to do there because the existing work, I think they only look at citation network, they look at, at the paper-paper relation. So at the whole, we had a paper last year at ACL about paper-paper relations. And so they look at, at the fine grain types between papers. But, uh, it would be really interesting to actually analyze the relation between two knowledge graphs. Um, because, you know, for example, um, like uh, attention for image recognition, object recognition, and the attention for name tagging, these two papers, they don't share a lot of the sentence embedding representation, but on knowledge graph, they might share some similarity. So, yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Other questions, please? How do you make sure that your generated introduction or conclusion are talking about the same topic? Let's say some of your results, the previous sentences and the, the, the latest sentences are on different topics and on different uh, chemical uh, substances. Yeah, so so the, uh, when we generate the conclusion, usual, we use the abstract as input. So we actually don't have a, sorry, in the results, we don't show, we didn't show the introduction part yet. So I, when, we, when we do the Turing test, the introduction is not able to beat the human uh, written introduction yet. But uh, when we turn future work, we actually use abstract as input. So usually the content between abstract and conclusion future work are quite coherent. Uh, and the example I showed here, they are not about the same title. So they're just for different titles to so use different topic. Um, but if you look at the, this example here, Actually, if you look at the system at the end of the conclusion future, but they share a lot of entities. And you can see it's a kind of repeating what's written here. But this one is actually repeating. So, do you use any uh, techniques to make sure that instead of block of text you generate, uh, every sentence are talking about the same topic? So, we we do we get a notch graph from the abstract, right? And then from the on this knowledge graph, we know these are the important entities we should pay attention um, to 
when we do the generation. And then for each entity, we check the bigger background knowledge graph, you know, what other entities are related, and use that as input. So we should also assign high ways to those entities. And then put them. So this language model is trained from the abstract and the conclusion pairs from human related fields. Does that make sense? So it's like the old papers help us to learn the templates to stick the entities together, but we make sure the entities are the input entities are from the abstract and the background knowledge graph. So we make sure the conclusion includes all these highlighted entities. But how can we organize it together? These uh, you know concrete words, these templates are known from language models from all the papers. Yeah. We actually need to check out how many output, you know, are topically coherent with input. Maybe we should try that. Can we I mean, truly test them only do comparison? Do really we need to check the, the relation between input and output? Maybe we should try that. I mean, they couldn't implicitly do that because if they find that the conclusion is really off topic, they will say that's fake. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the human written conclusion is also sometimes a bit off topic. <laughs> 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 Just like, we write that in the last minute, right? <laughs> Before submission deadline. Okay, okay thank you very much. Time. Uh, let's thank our speaker thank again. You.